Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Cancer in the Era of COVID-19 Public Health Perspectives. It's my pleasure to introduce you to you our featured speaker, Dr. Tala Al-Rusan. Dr. Al-Rusan is an internal medicine physician and epidemiologist who designs and develops large scale population studies to understand and evaluate public health interventions. She is currently an assistant professor at the Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health and Human Longevity at the University of California, San Diego. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. If you have any questions that arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit it in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following this presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tala Al-Rusan. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Welcome. Thank you so much, Susie. Thank you for being here today. Um, my name is Tala Al-Rusan. I will be discussing uh, cancer in the era of COVID-19 from a public health perspective. My disclosure, the support for this program is provided by Abbott and the information I'm presenting here is based on my own interpretation of the evidence and clinical experience. So just a little refresher to remind us all of uh, coronaviruses and the novel 2019 uh, coronavirus pandemic. So coronaviruses are important human and animal pathogens, as we all know. They've uh, been here with us and lived um, on this planet for a long time and have caused some other pandemics and outbreaks, such as the Spanish flu in 1918. In 2019, a novel coronavirus was identified and uh, has caused um, the pandemic that we know of today, which is COVID-19 pandemic. The virus that is uh, causing this pandemic is designated as severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2. The problem with this virus is that it's highly contagious and um, vaccines do not seem to cause long-lasting immunity for it. Um, just like a flu virus, um, we are yet to understand how to develop long-lasting immunity for it. Um, also, there are disparities in incidence and mortality rates that make control very difficult. Up until today, there are more than 900,000 people that have died due to COVID-19 worldwide. Um, and we believe that it would be, as they say, a marathon uh, trying to combat this pandemic rather than um, an easy task. So the pandemic has impacted all areas of daily life as you know it, including medical care. So the delivery care model has been impacted, especially for cancer patients in many ways. Um, there are competing risks as we know it. Um, cancer patients are immunocompromised, which um, puts them at great risk for contracting the virus and uh, for dying from it. Um, there are interruptions to care for patients for patients with cancer, as well as the lack of resources. So, so many people now have been reshuffling resources in a way uh, that has impacted cancer patients negatively, and we'll be discussing that in more depth. Um, as they say, there is no one size that fits all approach to delivering care. So for cancer patients, as you know, we're talking about personalized medicine, we're talking about different case by case uh, type of, uh, of, of care that is impacted course, by all this interruption um, to care, um, as well as the problem of having no international guidelines. Of course, because it's a new pandemic, we are still struggling to really have a centralized approach to dealing with it when it comes to cancer patients. So now we're seeing a lot of drive-through blood draw injections. Um, we're seeing some staff travel restrictions, social distancing in waiting rooms and work areas. Um, new screening procedures and laws when it comes to cancer patients who are in active treatment and those who are screening for cancer. And of course, we're seeing the major shift to telemedicine and virtual check-ins. So patients with cancers, as we said, are one of the groups that are most impacted by the pandemic for two main reasons. Number one is that they are immunocompromised. So there is some status of systematic immunosuppressive state that these patients have. And number two, the requirement for frequent admission to the hospital. 
which of course increases the risk of getting the virus. As we know, or as we may expect, incident cancer diagnoses may increase during or after the pandemic due to halted screening. So of course, screening is being impacted the most during this pandemic, one would think. And again, we will be discussing this in today's talk in more depth, but this is a time for us to think ahead and develop evidence-based guidelines for management. Um, the big question in research right now is that, does cancer increase one's risk of contracting coronavirus and getting COVID, or is it the other way around? Patients who get COVID um, are at increased risk of developing cancer. Um, and I think it's a mixture of both, really. So both sides of the story could be true, and there's a lot of research and resources now heading into that direction to really try to answer these questions so we know that cancer increases um, uh, risk for COVID through um, immunodeficiency. So cancer patients are immunocompromised usually. Certain cancers like lung cancer, there is already a pre-damaged lung. So we're expecting um, COVID to present itself in a more severe form in lung cancer patients, as well as of course the comorbidities that cancer patients usually have, such as hypertension, diabetes, and of course, the frequent hospitalization of cancer patients increases the risk of contracting the virus while being hospitalized. And also a big question remains is that, um, what happens if someone gets COVID? And now, um, you know, looking at different disease models, we don't understand on the long term, if someone contracted the virus, would they have some lingering effect? For example, some research now is showing that COVID might have some um, you know, might cause, cause some brain damage. We know now that um, there is an increased inflammation, persisting chronic inflammation status to, due to COVID. Um, we know that the, um, the virus enters the cell through the ACE receptors or the angiotensin converting enzyme receptors. So it really does affect the biochemistry of cells. Um, so could that promote oncogenic transformation? Could cells become more cancerous at a higher rate or at an earlier stage? So that's a question that is um, out there for researchers and now they're actively um, seeking answers for it. So what's the global burden of cancer? We know now that um, almost 18 million people or a little over 18 million people in the world have cancer. Um, and the projections are that in 2040, more than 27 million people will have cancer. So that's a big jump. Um, and cancer accounts for 8.8 .8 million deaths annually. 70% uh, of these deaths happen and occur in low and middle income countries. So in the grand scheme of things, one in five men and one in six women have cancer or have had cancer at some point in low life. And that one in eight men and one in 11 women die of cancer or blood. So it's a huge global burden. Um, this burden, as we said, is expected to grow and it's even expected to grow exponentially at a, at a higher pace in less developed countries than in more developed countries. So Asia, we know, accounts nearly for half of all cancer cases now, um, and more than half of cancer deaths worldwide. And we believe that Asia and Africa um, have higher proportion of cancer deaths compared uh, with their incidence, meaning that they have higher frequency of cancer types that have poorer prognosis, um, as well as limited diagnosis, training, and treatment capabilities which makes these countries really at higher um, um, risk of developing a larger global burden uh, of cancer. So why are we expecting more people to be diagnosed with cancer? For two reasons. Reason number one is the population growth. So we know that uh, the population is growing worldwide. Reason number two is they're getting older, right? So um, aging, also global aging is a major issue. Um, as well as the risk factors, of course. So here in the UK, for example, they've done research modeling and predicting um, 
the um, numbers of people that um, will have cancer in 2035. And cancer is due to risk factor changes only. So by looking at numbers only of people, um, you know, there's a large number of people that will get cancer because of population growth, but also because of risk factors and how we're, you know, our life is changing, technology, how we're having more sedentary lifestyles, obesity, that all is also contributing to uh, this picture of having um, larger prevalence rates and incidence rates of cancer. Um, also, there are certain types of cancer that are clearly underfunded in terms of research, like lung cancer. So we know that lung cancer accounts for 13% of new cancer diagnoses. Um, almost a quarter of all cancer deaths are due to lung cancer. And uh, the survival beyond five years is really low when it comes to lung cancer. However, when you think about funding or look at the funding and the numbers, only 6% of federal research dollars are designated to look at lung cancer and research lung cancer. Um, how is this pandemic affecting cancer research? So a survey by the American Cancer Society um, surveyed about 488 funded cancer researchers here in the United States, and it showed reduced cancer research capacity and efficiency. So most of them are not being able to uh, resume their research, of course, due to lockdowns and due to underfunding and other research. And again, we'll talk about this a little more um, later on. We also know that pre-pandemic, there were clear disparities in cancer screening. So for example, whites um, are 32% more likely to be up to date with um, cancer screening, such as colorectal cancer, than American Indians or Alaska Natives. Um, we know that women in the highest income brackets are more likely to be up to date with cervical cancer, or breast cancer screening than women in the lower income. Um, we know that women who have private health insurance are more than twice as likely to be up to date with, with screening too. So these disparities exist. They exist on a global level socioeconomic status, where you live, so many things impact how much you know about cancer and how often you screen um, and how you receive your care. What about cancer and numbers during the pandemic? So um, in England, they did this national population-based modeling study looking at uh, different cancer prevalence rates and incidence rates. They looked at breast cancer, lung cancer, esophageal cancers. And by looking at the wait time in emergency presentation and how much care these cancer patients are receiving, they have seen um, more deaths of cancer. Of course, again, because people are not screening, they're delaying care, there's an interruption uh, to care. So there was seven to 10% more deaths in breast cancer. 15 to 16% more deaths in lung cancer, and 4 to 5.3 in esophageal cancer. So again, this pandemic is really impacting uh, cancer patients disproportionately. And recently, only last month, there was a study uh, by the uh, JAMA, by the Journal of the American Medical Association, that showed that more, um, well, they uh, studied more than 200,000 cancer patients. They looked at pre-pandemic and current incidence rates of many types of cancer. And this study in particular has shown significant decline in newly identified cancers. So unlike what one would predict, um, we are not able to pick up these numbers. That's why we are seeing lower incidence rates of cancer during the pandemic. Findings were also similar from to studies from the Netherlands Cancer Registry, which is a national cancer res registry as well, and very representative of uh, the people of Netherlands, as well as the UK, um, where one study has shown 75% decline in referrals from, for suspected cancer since COVID restrictions were implemented. So this is a JAMA study where people have looked at numbers, researchers have looked at numbers, between March and April, as, and you, as you can see, 
uh, the newly identified patients' numbers have decreased exponentially for almost all these types of cancers since the pandemic has hit. So how does one provide safe care for patients during these challenging times? Um, the American Society of Cancer, Clinical Oncology, and CDC have offered some guidance through guidelines that they have come together and put together. Um, these, guidance, uh, these guidelines offer guidance on general healthcare facility and healthcare professional guidance, clinical care guidance, home care guidance, and um, what do we do to high risk subpopulation guidance, so certain types of cancers. It seems like in general, any clinic visit that can be postponed is being postponed. So routine surveillance visits like mammograms, colonoscopy are being postponed now due to the lockdown and the mitigation containment efforts that we're using for this pandemic. Um, screening clinics are being developed to allow for patients with symptoms to be evaluated and tested before entering the facility. So the goal is if there is a COVID patient, you need not to get them inside the facility. There are concerns about the halt in national screening programs in most countries. And we know Japan, for example, has a national cancer screening program that is excellent. Even that is being halted now and stopped before because of the pandemic. And this has impact on future cancer mortality, as I said. So one should think of these numbers and what happens since people are not being able to go and screen for the cancers. So the backlog of patients with symptoms um, will happen once we are um, into this pandemic and we start to loosen the, the lockdown measures that we're taking and uh, systems have to be prepared for that. Now, for the anti-cancer treatments also, there is, of course, delaying the elective surgeries that people are having, such as reconstructive breast surgery, et cetera. Those are, are, are all being delayed. Um, usually, they're resumed if infection rates are downward for at least two weeks, and if, um, if resources can be um, you know, looked at in a way that a hospital now feels okay with returning patients to with elective surgeries. Also, you know, scheduling of cases and prioritization of cases um, is usually managed by all stakeholders. So different, you know, surgeons and doctors who are internal medicine doctors, they all have to agree to return this patient for elective surgeries. For radiation therapy, um, randomized clinical trials now support deferring also radiation therapy across a multitude of cancers. Um, and they tend to um, place systemic therapy first in the treatment sequence. Overall, for chemo, immunotherapy, and systematic, there is no direct evidence to support changing or withholding chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Um, however, it's case-by-case -case, uh, basis, and of course, it depends on the provider and the place where um, someone is receiving their uh, treatment. So, of course, um, you know, Al Shamsiel and some other uh, researchers have come together under an international collaboration group to put some guidelines, such as the one we're seeing in front of us, um, that can guide our decisions um, to therapy during these times. Also, it's worth um, mentioning that this shift of telehealth is impacting patients a lot, especially cancer patients. Um, so now. Uh, providers are thinking of how to deal with patients uh, through the video and phone calls, um, what kind of questions they should expect, you know, the, the notion of empathy and how do you do that virtually. These are all things that are new and being um, presented to us by this pandemic. We also know that mental health is a big aspect of cancer patients um, and cancer care. Uh, we know that patients usually with cancer present with stress, depression, anxiety, insomnia, denial, anger, fear. Um, and there are studies now surveying patients uh, with cancer um, on, um, you know, how do you feel during these COVID times or the COVID pandemic? Um, some, you know, more than half are worried, of course, 
45% are understanding, 42% are anxious, many are stressed, 33%, and 22% are depressed. We also have to not ignore the, um, the mental health toll on uh, providers and caregivers, family caregivers, providers, physicians are complaining from burnout, isolation, worry about own health during COVID times and contracting the virus, as well as competing demands at work. Many doctors and providers are being pulled into COVID service or caring for COVID patients. Of course, that comes with its own mental health challenges. Some of the coping mechanisms or suggested solutions now are to create coping mechanisms, um, groups, communication guide, again, like the one we've seen before, that uh, where providers can learn more on how to navigate um, care using telehealth, as well as supportive measures that could be offered to, to patients. So this is a survey that was done by the Cancer Action Network, American Cancer Society, where they surveyed more than 3,000 cancer patients and survivors on the types of insurance they have, um, as well as the burden uh, that COVID-19 is presenting them with. So 49% um, of all patients surveyed had employer-provided insurance, 32% had Medicare, 7% um, were privately insured, 4% were Medicaid, and 7% had no coverage at all. Um, and they asked these patients whether they were worried that the financial impact of COVID-19 will cause and will make it harder for them to afford care as a cancer, sur cancer survivor. Of course, the lower the income, the more likely you are to be worried about that, about receiving care as a cancer survivor during COVID time, but also uh, those who were in the high income as well were worried. So 21%, which is almost a quarter of all patients who are in the high income category were also uh, worried about receiving um, less care as a cancer survivor due to the pandemic. Also, the effects of COVID-19 in healthcare um, were obvious in terms of um, Almost 27% of respondents who were in active treatment for cancer, uh, their care or treatment was delayed or canceled, versus 24% of those who are could be cancer survivors or um, uh, in between. So um, it did impact everyone, those who are in active treatment and those who are survivors. A cross-sectional study on COVID infection mortality rate from 396 counties in the United States, from seven states, um, looked at COVID in cancer patients. And um, those who were African-American, older, and had increased risk of ICU stay and intubation were more likely uh, to contract COVID-19. So cancer patients, again, cancer disparities um, are obvious. The pandemic is shedding the light on these disparities, which is very important for us to kind of have these conversations on um, and should guide the way we think about health and well-being in general for cancer patients. Also, socioeconomic factors, as we mentioned before, as well as other social determinants of health play a major role in explaining these disparities. So where you live, what kind of job you have, are you an essential, essential worker that you cannot stay at home? Um, all of these things explain uh, much of what we, what we are seeing due to the can pandemic in cancer patients. So bringing such data to the surface um, will help us um, understand these structural issues and understand also who to screen, how to um, reach these hard to reach populations and these minority populations, et cetera. So this is the time to be really thinking about this, even um, to tackle cancer and its disparities. So equitable cancer care is really something that I think uh, should be completely emphasized due to this pandemic and will be how we think about cancer care moving forward. So non-communicable diseases, um, you know, prevention and control should be a global 
priority, although this pandemic is presenting itself through an infectious disease, um, non-communicable disease remain a big killer worldwide. And um, if we do not address that, then any virus in any future pandemic could really cause what we're seeing right now and the loss of lives that we are seeing right now. Universal healthcare should be a human right and should be rethought in every single country. And um, I take the code of Princess Dina Maria of Jordan, who is also the president-elect of the Union for International Cancer Control. Her vision is really that we cannot combat cancer unless we um, talk about universal health care and about making non-communicable disease uh, prevention control a global priority. Also, improving breast cancer survival is a big thing, especially in the less developed world. Um, we need to talk more and invest more um, in breast cancer survival. And we need to share the global responsibility to support certain groups, such as refugees with cancer and hard to reach populations and conflict zones. You know, all of those are contributing to the cancer disparities that we're seeing right now due to COVID. So what if a patient who has cancer is infected with COVID? What are the numbers like? What is the picture like? Incidence in cancer patients was higher in studies from China, about three times higher, and from Spain, about four times higher. However, um, also studies from Europe have suggested similar or lower incidence of um, COVID-19 in cancer patients when compared to the general population. So the evidence on that is mixed and still we are yet to capture that in more studies and more statistics as um, we head into the new year. Prevalence rates also varied in studies. So um, if infected, likelihood of severe illness and death from COVID-19 is higher, and that's something you all agreed about. We um, talked about uh, how cancer could increase your risk of, um, of, of dying from COVID-19 due to the systemic immunocompromised state status that patients have, but also the chronic persistent inflammation that is believed to happen due to the disease, the COVID disease. Um, a meta-analysis study included 32 international studies and looked at 46,000 patients or more, showed uh, an increased all-cause mortality in cancer patients due to COVID, as well as increased ICU admissions and um, um, it is believed that 1% of all patients with cancer who has COVID have had, uh, sorry, 1% of all patients who, has, who have COVID now have had a history of cancer before. So this is the socio-ecological model, which is really the basics of uh, public health science and research. We don't think of health as only individual factors, but rather is the interpersonal, organizational, community, and public policy um, layers that all interplay in uh, dictating one's health and prognosis, especially when it comes to cancer. So while certain cancers like lung and hematologic cancers are associated with increased risk of mortality from COVID-19, uh, the social determinants of health play a major role in prognosis from COVID-19. Um, and that's why we're seeing higher mortality rates in, as we said, patients from racial and ethnic minorities, those who live in rural areas compared to those who live in suburban areas. Um, the impact of whether the cancer is active and whether the patient is currently receiving treatment also remains unknown at this point. So some research needs to be done in that area. Now, what's the effect of cancer treatment in COVID-19 severity? Um, and a recent study also has been um, looking at more than 900 patients from the US, Canada, and Spain. It showed no higher 30-day mortality rates in cancer patients who had COVID-19. So this is, again, some um, unlike what we've seen in the previous studies. These, uh, this study um, is saying that there is no higher mortality rates in cancer patients who have COVID. Um, also, a similar study from the UK has showed similar results. 
However, as we know, the type of cancer and the treatment you're receiving may influence the risk. Um, there was a study that retrospectively looked at um, symptomatic COVID-19 patients who were treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. They had threefold the risk of hospitalization and um, severe uh, COVID presentation. Um, however, cytotoxic chemotherapy did not show a significant association. So again, these are studies that could inform our guidelines uh, on how to manage, manage cancer patients. There are, again, some challenging types of cancers like solid tumors, hematologic malignancies, and COVID-19. Together, with if someone has these kind of tumors and had COVID-19, the prognosis is believed to be worse um, due to older age, comorbidities, and immunocompromised status. Another challenge in these patients are um, that some of them are under cytoreductive treatment or immunotherapy. So patients with lung cancer or metastatic lesions, for example, they might present with symptoms similar to COVID-19, which makes it difficult to really manage these patients. Um, also certain type of tumors like brain tumors and, and um, uh, people who have brain cancers they often have to travel to hospitals. Hospitals are more advanced, you know, they offer better care and more advanced care. Um, so this all impacts um, their quality of life in terms of the fear of facing this pandemic with an immune system that is significantly weakened by the disease, by the treatment as well, steroid, radiotherapy, or chemotherapy. So what's happening when it comes to testing and cancer patients. So we usually are doing priority testing for uh, cancer patients who either present with symptoms or are exposed to a COVID positive person. However, if a person has no symptoms and had not been exposed to someone who had COVID, it really varies across institutions. So for cancer patients with lower respiratory symptoms or signs, um, those who have fever, cough, dyspnea, um, we like to proceed with um, nucleic acid, usually amplification testing. Testing would be preferred prior to highly immunosuppressive treatments. So um, at some institutions, um, testing of asymptomatic patients um, prior to initiating anti-cancer treatment is limited to those who have uh, blood cancers or hematologic malignancies. Many places offer testing to all lung cancer patients. Um, and again, it varies from one place to the other, from one country to the other, based on test availability and resource availability and what the team thinks is best and should be done and how resources should be allocated. So this is really to discuss more about testing as we know it. There are two types of testing. Um, testing um, that is uh, viral RNA detection and uh, viral antibody response detection. And both of those testing techniques have their own limitations. Um, we know that a return to chemotherapy criteria um, could be entertained once reliable antibody testing and viral titers are Develop. So really, um, false positives and false negatives and how sensitive the testing um, is could dictate whether we um, go back to chemotherapy or not. Um, as testing becomes more bi widely available, it may be reasonable to test all asymptomatic patients um, who will be receiving immunosuppressive anti-cancer therapy or who are believed uh, to otherwise be at risk for serious complications from COVID-19. And the results of such testing can really inform decisions about delaying cancer therapy versus not. Also, testing is very important as we think about vaccines in the future. So after we develop a vaccine, antibody testing may aid in vaccinating those with low titer of protective antibodies. So really, when you think of how cancer patients present themselves, 
they're either um, asymptomatic or symptomatic carriers of COVID-19. So it's very important to be uh, developing testing that is uh, highly sensitive and specific and can give us the accurate answers so that we could proceed with uh, our, our decisions for therapy and what's next. Patients with B-cell malignancies like lymphoma or multiple myeloma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, they will likely have distinct antibody responses. So those patients may require a specialized pathway and specialized um, testing techniques. So that's also an area that is very important to be researching and doing. Patients with a known exposure need to be tested, of course, quarantined and closely followed up. Now, we know that due to the restrictions uh, and the lockdown and the reallocation of resources, um, clinical trials, many cancer clinical trials are being halted. Um, we also know that now COVID is making us rethink how we, um, we do discoveries, right? So COVID-19 infection has led to shortening of traditional regulatory time, timelines. Um, this experience should stimulate similar urgency in the way future cancer research is conducted. So hopefully we we'll learn from this pandemic how to get things on the market and to patients who need it faster. Now, what are the lessons, the big lessons that this pandemic is teaching us? First of all, invest in public health. It's very hard to invest in something that you don't see in front of you. It's very hard to prevent things. That's why we are having difficulty screening for cancers and asking people to screen. Um, but hopefully this pandemic is teaching us that even if you don't see something, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Um, also, underserved population offer, often, often suffer from chronic comorbidities. So again, those are and should be our target populations for increased screening efforts, prevention research, genetic research. Um, these populations have less access to healthcare, usually for chronic conditions, including cancer. And sometimes they don't have the ability to shelter in place, as we said. Most of them are essential workers. So all of these factors need to be addressed. Family members at the bedside also is something very important. And we're learning now that due to COVID, you know, a lot of cancer patients, unfortunately, are, are dying without any family members on their website, on their bedside, which is really a big problem. Also, ICU nurses, usually there's shortage, there's shortage of staff. So now we need to invest more in, um, in this field and in this area. Of course, we need to diversify our clinical trials more. So providing a valid and vetted communication channel to get more minority groups, more women into our clinical trials are extremely important. So communicating the importance of clinical research is extremely important. Um, and separating signal from noise, the opportunities that having all of this information creates for data and technology to provide meaningful and large scale impact are really large. And I think this pandemic is um, helping us rethink how um, we can advance cancer therapies and cancer uh, technologies and innovation in cancer care. Um, instead of just looking at the um, tough picture of losing a lot of patients due to cancer, due to halted screening. So again, really looking into the opportunities is something we should be thinking about. Now, the greatest challenge is how do we help people who are afraid to seek care to begin with? Um, most of our public health messaging regarding COVID has focused on um, mitigation and containment efforts, so social distancing, washing hands, PPE. Um, we also need to um, really think about, um, you know, whether you have COVID or not, we are still here for you. So as systems for cancer patients, we need to really be rethinking how, despite all what's happening, um, how do we manage these uh, risk versus benefit? 
I think a great opportunity for us during this pandemic is to rethink um, breast cancer care. So um, the falling costs of sequencing DNA have created an opportunity for us to explore new approaches uh, to screening, which incorporate genetic information. Um, and really it's important now to, to revisit that and think of, um, of uh, clinical trials that can um, um, introduce um, new therapies and um, incorporate genetic information. As the tools and methods for screening improve, doctors can start to do less screening for people who are at lower risk. This is the way that the field is going to evolve. So we need to put resources to the people who need them the most. I think MamaPrint assay uh, is really an interesting uh, technology. So there was an, a recent um, research that was presented at the 2020 American Association for Cancer Research virtual meeting that happened a few months ago. And it highlighted how um, mammoprint assay may effectively guide chemotherapy decisions during the COVID-19 pandemic. So these technologies could help us really make decisions on uh, to move forward or not. So uh, using mammoprint and hormone receptor positive patients with up to uh, three nodes uh, in whom chemotherapy is considered, the treatment can be limited, allowing safe de-escalation of therapy without increased cancer-specific mortality from COVID. Now, eradicating cancer is a big dream, and it's what we all work for in the cancer community, and it lies uh, in both fields, I think. The biggest opportunity is to work on prevention, so prevention research is key, Cancers do not have a single cause, as we know, and um, much of the work could be invested in prevention, as well as genetics research, which is really the holy grail would be a test that could pick up the earliest warning signs or signals of cancer. Um, a popular vision would be to use such tests in the general population. So hopefully the future would be a test, a genetic test that could be applied to everyone in the population. So in summary, the data is clear in showing that severe illness from COVID is higher among adult patients with lung cancer and certain types of cancer. The data is mixed on other types of cancer. However, um, you know, more research is emerging now, which is really great. And the data on whether recent cancer therapy impacts severity are mixed. So the most important risk factor for uh, severe disease usually are things uh, that have nothing to do with cancer, such as social determinants of health, how old you are, where you live, how many comorbidities you have. Um, of course, the psychological impact of this pandemic on cancer patients and uh, providers and caregivers is huge. Um, communication is key. So again, in the cancer world and cancer research, it's very important for us to all come and sit together and, and talk such as this summit that hopefully will host uh, some of the most brilliant minds in the world to come together and share um, their views on uh, the future now that this pandemic has been affecting every aspect of life. Innovations in testing and screening for both cancer and COVID should be hand in hand so we should not wait on cancer. As they say, cancer does not wait, even if there's a pandemic. Um, so yes, this is again a slide for how every, um, every aspect of the cancer care model and every stakeholder should come together and try their best to not let this pandemic uh, impact um, how we research cancer, how we uh, provide new drugs and new therapies, or how we think of innovations in cancer. If there, if there are take-home messages that I would like you to have from here, from this talk, is that the balancing of, of risks of delaying cancer versus um, not, uh, or versus the risk of, of COVID-19 exposure are challenging. The guidelines are changing. It is a rapidly changing situation. 
cancer research should be prioritized and funded and should not be um, you know, halted due to the pandemic. Clinicians should proactively discuss goals of care um, and advanced care planning, including advanced directives, especially for those with advanced cancer who are at an elevated risk for COVID-19, such as um, lung cancer patients. Finally, this is a picture of Mildred Geraldine, who, um, who was recently featured in the news here in the United States. Um, Mildred has survived the 1918 Spanish flu, COVID-19, and cancer. And um, I know, although I painted a little bit of a, a tough image now by showing these statistics of the global uh, cancer burden and how this pandemic could be negatively impacting uh, cancer research and advancements, I want us all to be thinking like Mildred. It wasn't bad, and uh, we will get through this, and hopefully, um, you know, the pandemic will actually be the reset button that will help us innovate and help us all come together as a global community and uh, tackle the global burden of cancer. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge Princess Dina, who is the president of the Union for International Cancer Control, the Global Cancer Oncology, the European Society for Medical Oncology, our colleagues at the International Agency for Research on Cancer, as well as my colleagues at the American Society for of Clinical Oncology. These are my references, and thank you so much for attending this talk. Thank you, Dr. al Rusan, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move into the live Q&A portion of the presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. So let's take a look. I see some questions already in our Q&A. Dr. al Rusan, <clears throat> in Africa, there are no clear guidelines on what to do when a patient with cancer on chemotherapy develops a fever. What would be your advice to that? Thank you so much for that great question. Um, and hello to my colleagues in Africa. Um, it's a great question. You know, we cannot ignore the possibility of a cancer patient developing um, neutropenic fever, malaria, typhoid. What if someone presents with those and he has cancer? Um, should we call the overstretched and under-resourced COVID-19 team, you know, the paucity of, of protective, uh, personal protective equipment and gear and on-site testing kits for patients and healthcare staff um, on the continent of Africa is a major flaw in delivering life-saving care for ca cancer patients. Um, I think the availability of logistics, which are greatly inadequate, um, institutional guidelines and the country-specific COVID-19 case burden um, will dictate actions. So really, Africa is a large continent, and each country is dealing with a pandemic very differently. I know in West Africa, for example, the COVID-19 protocols are defined by individual institutions. However, in South Africa, who are now dealing with local epidemics, small local epidemics um, of concern is HIV, um, and um, a TB, which includes approximately 8 million people who live uh, with HIV in South Africa. So, so far, cancer care is impacted um, by um, competing risks, as we said. Um, oncologists in Africa, despite the absence of a centralized um, guideline or plan, they are actually pragmatically safeguarding uh, their patients and workforce. Um, it's a difficult task. There is no um, perfect answer for this. However, I feel despite the scarcity of resources, they're doing a great job. Thank you. And Dr. Rusan, you've touched in your talk on screening. In regards to thinking about COVID testing, how important, in your opinion, is screening to cancer? And this is a two-part question. How would screening change the cancer picture in the future? That's a great question. As, as we mentioned during this talk, screening has been halted uh, due to the pandemic. And we feel that um, 
screening is extremely important for cancer. As you know, we pick up cancer at an earlier stage. We uh, reallocate resources in the way they should be allocated. So they go to patients who really need to be treated for cancer. So the whole idea is that um, screening should be invested in more and more. And this pandemic is showing that actually, despite uh, the fact that we're halting screening, uh, patients are uh, being impacted and we will see this backlog in the future. So we will see more cancer patients presenting because of, of these um, uh, lack of screening. So for example, for something like colorectal cancer, screening could really impact survival and could uh, impact which stage you pick up the cancer. So screening is something that should be invested in heavily worldwide. Um, whether there is a pandemic or not, from my own perspective, screening should be always prioritized. Thank you. And do you see cancer testing moving into home testing using testing kits, just like COVID-19 testing changed in such a short period of time? For sure. And I think during this talk, that was the main point that we're trying to emphasize. So again, we're seeing testing as um, an innovative testing techniques that could be genetic, that could pick up signals early on, and that could be distributed to the entire population. So the future should look something like this if we want to really tackle the global burden of cancer. Testing should be widely available for everyone. Testing should be uh, advanced in the sense that it uh, could pick up signals very early on. It could pick up uh, transformation and genetic material um, of cells early on. Thank you. So I would guess then you see cancer testing in the future changing to home testing. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Thank you so much. And we have time for one more question. It seems from your talk that cancer research may face a recession because of the pandemic. Can you elaborate on that and what should be done to avoid that from happening? Thank you for that question. Um, yes, you know, the exponentially increasing numbers of articles published uh, since February 2020 um, related to cancer and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic have really focused much on risk reduction and management of cancer patients during this outbreak as well as really characterizing um, cancer patients. So again, epidemiologically talking about statistics and um, which cancer patients suffer the most um, and um, et cetera. So really, we are mostly thinking in a myopic way at this point, just really trying to um, think about COVID-19 and a cancer patients. However, I think the priority of oncology researchers during this pandemic um, should not be only on uh, COVID-19 among cancer patients. Um, this is something we're seeing in other fields of, of research as well. We call it the COVIDization of research. Um, at this point, really, I understand that uh, most governments are trying to secure their citizens and they want to make sure that the loss of lives and the numbers are not high up of those who die of COVID. However, um, a load of research and publications and new trials uh, in oncology should be to, um, you know, um, motivate cancer researchers to get back on track, get back to work once um, the restrictions are loosened, and to keep to keep um, innovating and to keep their uh, new trials, um, cancer in general, working and going on. Because again, cancer cannot wait. Very true. Thank you again, Dr. El Roussan, for this incredible presentation and for your important research. Thank you for the audience for your outstanding questions. We hope you found today's presentation informative and insightful. This presentation will be available on demand viewing and don't miss out on the other valuable presentations on our agenda. Visit the agenda tab in the auditorium for the full listing. Thank you again for your participation. Until next time, be safe. Stay healthy. Take care. Bye-bye.